Welcome everyone. Today we embark on an exploration of an era that forever changed the face of Europe, the age of Napoleon. This was a time of wars, of reforms, and of shifting ideologies. Indeed, Hal, and I think it's crucial to emphasize the monumental shift in legal systems due to Napoleon. The Napoleonic Code has been a foundation in many countries. While Amelia mentions the legal reforms, we must not overlook the economic upheaval during this period. Napoleon's policies had complex implications, some innovative, some disastrous. And let's not forget the political landscape. Napoleon's rise and rule were marked by a profound reorganization of European powers, setting the stage for future conflicts and alliances. Exactly, Mick. However, we shouldn't overlook the cultural and societal transformation across Europe. The spread of revolutionary ideas and nationalism reshaped not just political boundaries, but people's identities. While we're touching all bases, it's vital to remember the military genius of Napoleon. His campaigns, though controversial, showcase remarkable strategic insights that continue to be studied. True, Lenny, his military campaigns were pivotal. But let's not gloss over the human cost of his ambitions. The era was marked by widespread suffering and upheaval. Hal, speaking of costs, the economic strain of the continental system and its fallout had long-reaching effects, choking European economies and fostering resentment. You're right, Jazz. But it was that same economic strain that also led to legal innovation, pushing countries towards more uniform legal systems in response. It's fascinating how interconnected these aspects are. Napoleonic reforms, while oppressive to some, ironically also sowed seeds of nationalism and liberation movements. Well, Izzy, those liberation movements are a double-edged sword. They propelled Europe into a century of upheaval. Napoleon's legacy is not black and white. Absolutely, Mick. His military endeavors brought about an era characterized by both advancement and devastation. It takes a nuanced discussion to really unpack the effects. As we delve deeper into these topics, let's remember that while our views might differ, our goal is to illuminate the multifaceted legacy of the age of Napoleon. Let's dive into the rise of Napoleon. It's a period marked by his military brilliance and the political vacuum that allowed his ascent. Mick, how significant was this vacuum in his rise? Absolutely crucial, Hal. The chaos of the French Revolution created a perfect storm. Napoleon's genius was in how he navigated this disorder, cementing his power. While Mick makes a valid point about the political climate, we can't overlook Napoleon's sheer military prowess. His Italian campaign, for example, was not just about tactics, but his ability to inspire his men and foresee his enemies' moves. Inspiration alone doesn't explain his rise. It was his political acumen. He was a master manipulator. And yet, without his Italian victories, would we even know his name? His military success was the bedrock of his political power. Both of you make compelling points, but let's not downplay the economic aspect. His campaigns were as much about securing resources and disrupting Britain's economic strength as they were about military glory. While we're on the topic of underlying factors, let's not ignore the societal context. The Napoleonic Code later on, for example, reflected a desire for a stable legal system, which was a direct response to the chaos of the times. It's interesting to see how intertwined these factors are, military, political, economic, and societal. Izzy, What's your take on the impact of these campaigns on the broader European society? The impact was profound. Napoleon's victories spread revolutionary ideas across Europe, even as he positioned himself as a monarch. It's paradoxical. His rule both suppressed and spread revolution. Exactly, Izzy. That's why it's short-sighted to solely focus on his military genius. His legacy is more about how he exploited the existing conditions. But without that genius, Mick, we wouldn't be discussing how he capitalized on these conditions. His campaigns were studies in innovation and strategy. Strategy that had massive economic implications. His understanding of economic warfare, even flawed strategies like the continental system shaped Europe. Undoubtedly. And from a legal perspective, his initiatives laid groundwork that influences many legal systems to this day. It's an intricate tapestry of military, economic, and legal threads. Clearly, Napoleon's rise cannot be attributed to a single factor. His military genius, political savvy, 
the economic conditions of the time, and the legal vacuum all played roles. It's the combination that was potent. Thank you all for a spirited discussion. Let's keep these insights in mind as we transition to discussing the Napoleonic reforms. Let's dive into the profound reforms Napoleon introduced and their impact on Europe. Amelia, would you start us off with the Napoleonic Code? Certainly, Hal. The Napoleonic Code was revolutionary. It not only unified French law, but served as a model for legal systems worldwide. It emphasized clear, accessible law, eliminated privileges by birth, and allowed freedom of religion, among other things. Its impact is undeniable. While that's true, Amelia, I think you're glossing over the economic motivations behind these reforms. The Napoleonic Code and other reforms were not just legal triumphs. They were strategic moves to consolidate power and control economic mechanisms across the empire. I won't dispute the economic motivations, Jazz, but reducing these reforms to mere power plays undermines their lasting significance in legal history. Moving on, Jazz, could you expand on the economic ramifications of these reforms? Absolutely. Napoleon's administrative reforms modernized the European economies but they also placed heavy burdens on the conquered states. The continental system, for example, was disastrous for European economies, especially port cities reliant on trade with Britain. But Jazz, you can't deny the efficiency these reforms enacted. We saw the paving of roads, standardization of weights and measures, and the promotion of education, all of which indirectly bolstered the economic capabilities of the empire and beyond. Efficiency for France, maybe, Lenny. But at what cost to the autonomy and economies of the occupied territories? I think it's a glaring oversight to applaud these measures without critiquing their imperialistic motivations. Amelia, how do these economic perspectives align with your understanding of the legal reforms? The legal reforms, including the economic policies, created a blueprint for a centralized state, which was innovative. While they did consolidate power, they also laid the groundwork for modern legal and administrative systems, which I believe outweigh the temporary economic hardships. Temporary hardships? The economic embargoes led to widespread suffering. It's a narrow view to only consider the long-term outcomes without acknowledging the immediate human cost. And Mick, where do you stand on this? I think we're missing a key element here. The political landscape was radically reshaped by Napoleon's reforms. They dismantled feudal structures, yes, but they also placed absolute power in the hands of one man. The ripple effects on governance can't be overlooked. Mick's point is essential. While the reforms modernized Europe, they also reflected and entrenched Napoleon's authoritarian rule. It's a complex legacy, not just a set of legal codes or economic policies. It's clear we're looking at a multifaceted issue. Let's remember, the reforms had varying impacts depending on the region and time period in question. Exactly, Hal. It's the magnitude and breadth of these reforms that had such a lasting influence on Europe, despite their controversial nature. And yet, the debate on whether the ends justify the means is far from settled. Napoleon's vision for Europe came with a high price tag. A fitting point to pivot on. The impact of Napoleon's reforms, legal, economic, political, continues to be debated vigorously, as we've just demonstrated. Let's delve into the Napoleonic Wars, their key battles and strategies. Lenny, would you start us off with an overview? Absolutely, Hal. The wars were not just a display of Napoleon's military genius, but also a revolution in warfare itself. His strategies at Austerlitz, for example, were brilliant using the terrain and feigning weakness to lure his enemies into traps. I must interject, though. It's crucial to consider the alliances against Napoleon. His genius in battle was matched by a European coalition that was unprecedented. The concept of total war really emerged from this, with entire nations mobilized. That's a fair point, Mick, but we cannot overlook the economic strain these wars placed on Europe. Napoleon's ambition drained resources, which, yes, led to innovation in warfare, but also to severe hardship for civilian populations. Yet, you can't deny the effectiveness of his methods. The levy en masse and the concept of total war might have been economically draining, but they also created a sense of national unity. 
the impact on civilians cannot be understated. The wars ushered in a new era where the distinction between civilian and combatant blurred significantly. And let's not forget the spread of revolutionary ideas. Yes, the wars brought destruction, but they also carried the seeds of liberty and nationalism across Europe. Napoleon may not have intended it, but he was a vehicle for change. While revolution and change are valuable, the means to achieve them were catastrophic. The wars left Europe in a state of turmoil and disarray. It was a high price to pay for what some might see as progress. Economic motivations cannot be ignored here. Napoleon's wars were also about economic dominance. The continental blockade, for instance, aimed directly at undermining Britain's economic hegemony. But that very blockade and economic strategy backfired, demonstrating that Napoleon, for all his military acumen, had significant blind spots. Indeed, and let's not overlook the legal repercussions. Wars under Napoleon spurred significant legal changes across Europe, some of which laid the groundwork for modern legal systems. It seems we all agree that while Napoleon's military strategies were innovative, they also led to widespread suffering and changed the course of European history in multiple domains. The balance between military genius and the toll on humanity remains a contentious point. Let's delve into the continental system and its multifaceted impacts. Jazz, can you start us off with the economic intentions Napoleon had with this blockade? Certainly, Hal. Napoleon's primary goal was to cripple Britain economically, to break its trade supremacy by closing European ports to British goods. It was bold, perhaps too bold, aiming to bring Britain to its knees solely through economic pressure. An ambitious plan, but flawed. The continental system ignored the complexity of European economies. Britain's naval prowess allowed it to find other markets, and smugglers often bypassed the blockade. Fair point, Lenny, but we can't overlook the significant strain it placed on British merchants initially. Still, the repercussions on the continent were profound. Economic turmoil, shortages. And let's not forget the political backlash. Napoleon's move was deeply resented. It bred more opposition than support among European nations, contributing to his downfall. Napoleon failed to consider the broader political consequences of such an economic stranglehold. Jazz, how do you counter that? While I acknowledge Mick's point on the political backlash, it's essential to view the continental system as a catalyst for economic independence movements within Europe. Some nations started developing their industries out of necessity, which, in a twisted way, contributed to economic modernization. It's a stretch to call it modernization when the primary consequence was hardship for the lower classes. The economic blockades led to widespread scarcity and suffering. Napoleon's policy hurt ordinary people the most, widening the gap between them and the ruling elites. That's a poignant observation, Izzy. However, economic pressure was one of the few tools Napoleon had at his disposal to challenge Britain's dominance. The execution was flawed, undoubtedly, but the rationale behind it was grounded in real politic. Real politic or not, Jazz, Napoleon's underestimation of British resilience and adaptability was a critical blunder. The continental system ended up isolating France more than it did Britain. Isolation, yes, but it also forced Napoleon to look inward, pushing for greater self-sufficiency an unintended yet not altogether negative outcome. A costly way to achieve self-sufficiency at the expense of alienating half of Europe. The economic devastation cannot be understated, nor can the role it played in rallying opposition against France. It seems we're at an impasse. The continental system is a testament to Napoleon's ambition, arguably his hubris. It showcases the interplay between economics and warfare, and its effects are still debated today. Let's move on bearing in mind the complexities this strategy introduced to the Napoleonic era. Let's delve into Napoleon's impact on nationalism and the revolutionary ideas that swept across Europe. Izzy, kick us off with your perspective on how these concepts were spread through conquest. Well, Hal, Napoleon's campaigns, while militaristic, acted as vessels for revolutionary ideas. The principles of liberty, equality, and fraternity traveled with his armies, planting seeds of nationalism in occupied territories. 
This wasn't always by design, but the effect was profound. I'd have to push back on that optimism a bit. While it's true that revolutionary ideas spread, the nationalism that emerged was often reactionary. It wasn't just a quest for self-determination. It was opposition to French domination. We mustn't romanticize the spread of these ideas as purely enlightening. A valid point, Mick, but let's not overlook the economic angle. The economic turmoil that Napoleon's wars caused also fueled nationalism. As economies suffered, people rallied around the nation state as a protector against external threats. Ironically, sometimes against Napoleon himself. True, jazz, but that turmoil also broke down old structures, enabling the rise of these modern national identities. It's complicated. So it seems that Napoleon was both a catalyst for the spread of these ideas and inadvertently nationalism. Lenny, your thoughts on the military aspect? Militarily speaking, Napoleon's methods themselves were revolutionary. However, they bred a form of resistance that is the crucible of modern guerrilla warfare, a direct ancestor to today's nationalist movements. The irony here is palpable. He spread the very principles that would be used against him. But we must not forget the human cost of such military adventures. The spread of ideas sounds grand until you account for the devastation left in the wake of these campaigns. Mick raises an uncomfortable truth. Yet these painful histories are central to the narratives of national identity that emerged. They're etched deep into the cultural memory of nations. Financial suffering and cultural upheaval aside, the economic restructuring post-Napoleon laid groundwork for a modern Europe. Without this turmoil, the economic landscape today might be unrecognizable. It's a double-edged sword, military innovation and the unintended diffusion of nationalism. He reshaped the continent in ways that were unimaginable at the time. Indeed, it seems our views on Napoleon's impact on nationalism and revolutionary ideas are as diverse as the effects themselves, a complex figure in a transformative era. Let's continue to unravel these complexities as we proceed. Let's delve into the Peninsular War and its wide-ranging consequences. It's often seen as the beginning of the end for Napoleon's empire. Lenny, give us a strategic overview. Indeed, Hal. The Peninsular War drained French resources like a sieve. Napoleon underestimated the Spanish guerrillas and the British under Wellington. It was a logistical nightmare that bled the Grand Army dry. But it's important to remember the cultural revolution it sparked. Spanish nationalism soared. Art, literature, Goya's paintings come to mind, echoed this fierce resistance. It was the forge of modern guerrilla warfare, inspiring future movements worldwide. That's a romantic view, Izzy, but you're overlooking the broader political implications. This war exposed the cracks in Napoleon's administrative abilities. He stretched his empire too thin, both militarily and in governance. And let's not ignore the economic suicide of the venture. The Peninsular War diverted crucial resources and attention from the continental system, exacerbating economic strains across Europe. Jazz, while that's true, the military significance cannot be understated. It was a thorn in Napoleon's side, but also a formative theater of war. Without understanding the Peninsular War's military lessons, we miss crucial insights into Napoleonic warfare. Point taken, Lenny but focusing solely on military strategies diminishes understanding of the Peninsular War's impact on society. It was a seedbed for nationalism, which fundamentally altered the European landscape. These points are all valid. The Peninsular War was not merely a military campaign, but a catalyst for broader societal shifts. Mick, could you expand on the political aftermath? Absolutely, Hal. Napoleon's failure to pacify Spain and later Portugal demonstrated to other European powers that the French Empire was not invincible. This emboldened coalitions against him and sowed the seeds for his eventual downfall. But Mick, was it solely Napoleon's military overreach or did the economic fallout from his policies contribute just as significantly to his downfall? Economic fallout certainly played a role, jazz, but without the military defeats, Napoleon's political narrative could have withstood economic hardships. It's the combination that was deadly. Interestingly, those military defeats, particularly in the Peninsula War, served as a masterclass in the limitations of conventional warfare against guerrilla tactics. And remember, 
those guerrilla tactics inspired by the Peninsular War influenced national liberation movements for centuries. It's a testament to the enduring legacy of this struggle. Clearly, the Peninsular War's multifaceted impact, from military to economic to cultural spheres, demonstrates the complexity of Napoleon's legacy. Its consequences are far-reaching, influencing not just the course of the Napoleonic Wars, but also the fabric of European development. Let's delve into Napoleon's invasion of Russia, an ambitious campaign that turned disastrous. Lenny, can we start with your take on the logistical challenges faced by the Grand Army? Absolutely, Hal. The sheer scale of the invasion, over 600,000 troops, was unprecedented. But Napoleon severely underestimated the logistical nightmare. Russian terrain and weather were formidable foes, harsher than any enemy force. The Grand Armée's supply lines stretched too thin, making them vulnerable. It's hard not to see the economic harakiri in this decision. Dragging an entire economy to war across such vast distances without a sustainable supply chain? The fallout was inevitable. It crippled France economically. Jazz, while the economic suicide, as you put it, was clear the military blunder cannot be overstated. The scorched earth policy left by the Russians left Napoleon's army starving and freezing. A catastrophic failure of military strategy. Mick, your thoughts on how this campaign influenced the geopolitical landscape? Napoleon's Russian campaign was the beginning of the end for his empire. It broke the aura of invincibility surrounding him and his army, encouraging other nations to rise against him. Moreover, it shifted the balance of power, setting the stage for the alliance that eventually defeated him. And let's not overlook the human cost of this catastrophe. The Grand Army was decimated, with casualties estimated in the hundreds of thousands. The suffering and loss of life were immense, a stark reminder of the perils of overreaching ambition. While the human cost is undeniable, the legal ramifications were also significant. The failure in Russia weakened Napoleon's hold on the territories he'd conquered, indirectly influencing the subsequent legal reforms in these regions as they sought to reassert their sovereignty. But Amelia, the economic implications were far-reaching as well. The drain on resources destabilized not just France, but the economies of occupied territories. The campaign damaged Europe's economic landscape significantly. True, jazz. But remember, the failure also highlighted the limits of conventional warfare and the rise of total war. It was a pivotal moment that reshaped military strategy. A pivotal moment indeed, but one that cost Napoleon dearly. As we can see, the invasion of Russia was a turning point in European history, affecting everything from military tactics to economic systems, legal reforms, and the geopolitical order. Let's plunge into one of the most tumultuous periods of Napoleon's life, his exile, return, and the Hundred Days. Napoleon's escape from Elba was a turning point, but what led to his eventual downfall? Well, Hal, you mentioned the exile and return, but it's crucial to understand the legal framework that allowed such a dramatic event. The Treaty of Fontainebleau initially exiled Napoleon to Elba, aiming to create a legal end to his rule. Yet, it was this very treaty that Napoleon exploited to make a comeback, a fascinating legal loophole, if you will. But Amelia, while the legal aspects are intriguing, it was Napoleon's military audacity that really turned the tide. His return and gathering of support in those hundred days say so much about his charisma and strategic mind. People were willing to follow him again, despite the risks. Hold on, Lenny. You're oversimplifying things. Napoleon's return wasn't just about charisma. It was a desperate gamble in a high-stakes game. The economic turmoil of the time cannot be overlooked. France was struggling, and Napoleon thought he could capitalize on that turmoil. It's more than audacity. It's sheer desperation. Jazz makes a good point. However, desperation doesn't fully explain it. The geopolitical landscape of Europe was fundamentally altered during Napoleon's initial reign. His return, known as the Hundred Days, threatened to destabilize the precarious balance established in Vienna. What we're looking at is a complex interaction of personal ambition and European politics. Absolutely, Mick. And let's not forget the cultural and symbolic power of Napoleon's return. 
It wasn't just about politics or economics. It was a symbol of defiance, a last stand of the Napoleonic idea. His brief resurgence rekindled the flames of revolutionary fervor, a point often glossed over. But Izzy, wasn't that revolutionary fervor precisely what led to his final defeat at Waterloo? Europe had tired of the chaos Napoleon represented. Lenny, I disagree. Waterloo was more about Napoleon's strategic miscalculations and less about European sentiment. Plus, the economic impact of his previous policies still haunted France, complicating any efforts for a stable return to power. And let's not ignore the legal aftermath. Napoleon's surrender and subsequent exile to St. Helena were intricately tied to European leaders' desire to prevent him from ever disrupting the peace again. The legal machinations during this period were unprecedented. This discussion underscores the multifaceted nature of Napoleon's final days of power. Military, economic, legal, and cultural threads all weave together to mark the end of an era. Would anyone argue that this period was the definitive end of Napoleon's impact on Europe? Not at all, Hal. Napoleon's legacy didn't end with his exile. The ideas and reforms he introduced and the nationalist sentiments he stirred continued to shape Europe long after his death. Precisely, Mick. Napoleon might have lost at Waterloo, but the ideas he championed, or perhaps more accurately, the ideas his reign inadvertently propagated, lived on. They fostered a new European consciousness. It seems we can all agree that the age of Napoleon was indeed a defining moment in European history, marked by complexity and contradiction. Whether seen through the lens of military strategy, legal reform, economic policy, or cultural impact, Napoleon's exile, return, and the Hundred Days encapsulate the enduring enigma of Napoleon's legacy. Let's delve into the Congress of Vienna and its significant reshaping of Europe's borders. Mick, can you set the stage for us on its objectives? Certainly, Hal. The Congress of Vienna was primarily about restoring balance to Europe after the upheaval of the Napoleonic Wars. The leaders wanted to establish a new European order, one that would prevent the rise of a single dominant power, much like France under Napoleon. But let's not forget about its cultural ramifications. The redrawing of borders ignored the burgeoning sense of nationalism in various regions. It was as if the Congress treated nations and territories as mere chess pieces. True, Izzy. Yet the primary concern at the time was political stability, not cultural sensitivity. Unfortunately, that oversight sowed seeds for future conflicts. Speaking of oversight, the economic fallout was profound as well. The rearrangements solidified certain powers' economic dominance and left others in precarious positions, leading to tensions that would later escalate. And from a legal perspective, the Congress of Vienna represents a foundational moment in the development of international law, setting precedents for diplomatic processes. That's a valid point, Amelia, but let's not gloss over the military implications. The redrawing of borders significantly affected strategic balances. Some regions became indefensible, while others gained in strategic depth. These are all insightful observations. Yet, the Congress's decree to reinstate monarchies, doesn't that speak of a certain short-sightedness, Mick? Weren't they merely laying the groundwork for future revolutions? Hal, that's a somewhat contemporary perspective. From their point of view, they were striving for stability, relying on what they saw as tried and tested methods of governance. However, Hal raises a crucial point. This stability came at the cost of suppressing the democratic aspirations awakened during the French Revolution and the Napoleonic era. Exactly, Izzy. And from an economic standpoint, this stability was just a facade. The underlying economic disparities and tensions only grew, setting the stage for future upheavals. Let's not overlook the legal framework it attempted to establish. This was a moment when the principles of sovereignty and balance of power were being codified, principles that are still relevant today. I agree with Amelia on the importance, but the military ramifications cannot be understated. It was an attempt to create a buffer zone around France, but at what cost? The strategic vulnerabilities created then led directly to conflicts in the following century. These contrasting viewpoints illustrate the Congress of Vienna's complex legacy, it seems like for every step taken towards stability and peace, there was a price paid in cultural suppression, economic inequality, and future conflict potential.
Let's dive into the heart of our discussion today. Was Napoleon a tyrant, a hero, or does the truth lie somewhere in between? Well, Hal, I'll leap right in. You cannot deny the cultural revolution that occurred because of Napoleon. He certainly spread the ideals of the French Revolution across Europe. Liberty, equality, fraternity. Isn't that the mark of a hero? Those are pretty words, Izzy, but we have to look at the practicalities. Napoleon was an authoritarian. He crowned himself emperor. How does that reconcile with your so-called ideals of liberty and equality? Mick makes a valid point. Economically, Napoleon's ambitions crippled nations. The continental system was a disastrous policy that aimed to cripple Britain but ended up harming Europe's economy more. That's not the action of a hero in my book. While we're throwing around the term disastrous, let's not forget the military genius of the man. Yes, his ambition led to Europe burning, but his strategies and reforms to the military changed the face of warfare forever. There's some heroism in revolutionizing an art, even the art of war. Nevertheless, Lenny, revolutionary or not in warfare, one cannot overlook the Napoleonic Code. It's one of the few parts of his legacy that has undeniably shaped the modern world for the better, laying down civil law codes that still serve as the foundation for many laws today. See, Mick, it's not all black and white. Napoleon has indeed left a mark on the legal and cultural landscapes. I concede Amelia's point on the Napoleonic Code is well taken. However, advancing legal codes doesn't erase the tyranny of his rule, censorship, police state, endless wars. How do we reconcile that? And do not forget the economic turmoil. The man was a paradox, genius, yet his policies often led to severe economic disruption. He was a product of his time, a time of upheaval and war. Yes, his actions led to consequences, but so do all decisions in times of war. It seems we're circling around the complexity of Napoleon, hero or tyrant, his impact is undeniable, varying from military to legal, cultural to economic. True, Hal. It's simplistic to label him wholly one thing or another. His legacy is multifaceted, echoing through time. We must appreciate the shades within his character and actions. Exactly. Despite our vehement disagreements, deep down, we all acknowledge the indelible impact Napoleon has made on the world. Indeed. This passionate debate has shown just how nuanced our understanding of history needs to be. Thank you all for your insights and spirited discussion. Let's move to our concluding thoughts. We've traversed a vast landscape today discussing the age of Napoleon from numerous perspectives. What do you believe is Napoleon's lasting significance in today's world? Amelia, would you start us off? Certainly, Hal. Reflecting on the Napoleonic Code, it's clear that Napoleon's legal reforms laid the groundwork for the modern legal systems we see in many countries today. It's not just historical curiosity, it's the bedrock of contemporary civil law. While I see your point, Amelia, and the Code is undoubtedly significant, I can't help but argue that Napoleon's political legacy is even more impactful. The reshaping of Europe at the Congress of Vienna set the stage for future conflicts. It's impossible to overlook the shadows his actions cast over the 19th and 20th centuries. Both of you make compelling arguments, but don't you think we're missing the forest for the trees here? The economic upheaval and innovations of Napoleon's time. These are the underpinnings of much of our modern economic structure. Without understanding his impact on the continental economy, we're only getting half the story. If I may jump in, the military aspect cannot be understated. Napoleon transformed warfare, strategy, and military logistics. His innovations reverberate in military academies around the world to this day. How can we not see this as his most profound legacy? Lenny, while military history is rich with examples from Napoleon's campaigns, we're overlooking how he facilitated the spread of nationalism and revolutionary ideas. These movements reshaped identities and the cultural map of Europe, laying the groundwork for the modern nation state. It's this spread of ideas that I find to be his most indelible legacy. Fascinating points all around. It seems we're circling around the complexity of Napoleon's impact, which varied across legal, political, economic, military, and cultural spheres. Yet I sense some disagreement about which aspect holds the most weight. Can we not agree that the multifaceted nature of his legacy is what makes studying Napoleon so compelling? 
How, while I agree with the complexity, I must insist that the political ramifications of his rule, a Europe primed for both conflict and unification, are paramount. How can we equate the spread of legal codes with the very shaping of national boundaries and conflicts? Mick, the legal reforms introduced under Napoleon have a silent yet pervasive influence that has structured societies. Without these reforms, the political landscapes you refer to would be entirely different. I think you're both missing a critical point. The economic base determines the political superstructure. Napoleon's economic policies, for better or worse, catalyze transformations that neither legal nor political shifts could achieve on their own. And yet, without his military innovations and campaigns, none of these economic or legal transformations would have been possible. Napoleon's approach to warfare made him a figure we cannot ignore. But what about the people? The cultural shifts, the ideas that were mobilized, the awakening of national consciousness, these are the forces that truly shape history. It's clear that we each hold a piece of the truth in understanding Napoleon's vast impact. Perhaps the real takeaway is that his legacy cannot be confined to a single domain. As historians, scholars, and enthusiasts, it's our job to continue dissecting and discussing these multifaceted contributions to fully appreciate how they've helped shape the modern world. I want to thank each of you for a spirited and enlightening discussion today. It's clear that the age of Napoleon continues to offer rich ground for debate and reflection.